before we formally begin, I'll just get the PowerPoint showing on the screen. Good. Well, I'm humbled by uh, such kind words of uh, introduction and firstly uh, profoundly thank uh, Dr. Basu, Principal, for extending this invitation uh, to me to speak today um, and also uh, Bart Esmond's role in facilitating uh, this event as well as uh, my visit as, uh, as a whole. And it's always a very, uh, actually emotional time for me to come to Shalom and through the course of my talk, you'll get a sense of why that might be. And I'm sure you're all asking yourself the question, what is this Aussie guy from Melbourne doing in Shalom coming to talk to us about history? And I'm going to do a number of things today uh, and I'll give you a bit of a roadmap of what uh, my talk uh, entails. Firstly, I'm going to tell you briefly a little bit about myself, what I do, uh, what I do exactly. And then I'm going to offer you a few reflections about history. First up, I am a historian and as you would know from your uh, from teachers and academics. We all come to our uh, area of work with particular skills and expertise that we're trying to develop and craft and hone. Uh, and so I often reflect to myself, what is it that I do as a historian, professionally, vocationally, that, uh, that someone else can't do? Uh, and we all, uh, I think, in, the, in this big sort of house of knowledge and learning uh, in, the, uh, in the academic sense, it is a collaboration and we respect the, the skills uh, of our colleagues. But Desmond was talking about this connection that we've developed. Me as a historian, uh, Professor Kana Fung as a, as a folklorist. And this, this sense of thinking then about history is not just a conversation in the present, but also a, a, a craft that comes with particular methods and skills. I'm going to talk about that very briefly as an introduction. And then the bulk of my talk is about the colonial archive, and you'll get a sense uh, as I proceed uh, of what my approach and interests are there. And at times it's going to get a bit wordy, okay? Uh, and I hope you sort of follow along, but deliberately so, because I think it's about throwing out a challenge uh, to us all as teachers and students to engage with, with deep and complex thinking and ideas. Um, but I'm also going to be reflective, uh, and certainly in the last part of my, my talk, I'll talk a, a bit about some of the kind of practical um, projects that we're uh, working on. So, as has been mentioned, uh, I'm fundamentally an urban historian. So my interest is in cities, uh, how they work, uh, the culture of cities particularly. I'm not so much a political historian or an economic historian, although those aspects of history are important. I'm a social historian. What does that mean? It means that within these big uh, these big processes of history, what you might call the kind of meta processes, I'm interested in how the individual person on the ground experiences those things. Because I think often it's the individual person who gets left out of the big capital H history. We always need to, to take the, the macro and the micro together. 
but my particular interest and approach is in, let's, let's call it the micro. So some of my early work, um, the book Melbourne Street Life, uh, was about, uh, not exactly what it sounds like, the history of the streets. And if you think of, of your own uh, city of Shillong or other cities that you've come from or have visited, you know, what is the history of public space? How has that been experienced? How has it been regulated? How is it a, how is it a setting for the, the dynamics of, of, of culture? Um, so I, I looked at street processions and parades. I looked at um, hawkers and street vendors. Uh, I looked at, 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 at traffic management and, and, and pedestrians. Uh, always with a view to sort of the individual experience of the, of the street. I also did a, a book about uh, it might sound strange, but it's big in Melbourne, a, a book about the history of espresso coffee. Now we all know that we love a cup of coffee, uh, but globally the, the sort of Italian style espresso coffee is very popular, and Me Melbourne particularly is kind of a hub of that history. And I was very interested in the stories that people told about how we came to have that rich um, coffee culture, and it meant interviewing oral history, talking to particularly some of our uh, migrant groups, particularly the Italian community who came to Melbourne in particularly in the post-war period, who brought a lot of their, uh, their knowledge of coffee as well as the, the machinery that was the, the Gargia machine, the old coffee machine was an Italian invention. So this was a history of, 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 of drinks, of food culture, of multiculturalism, of the city, uh, and again, um, very much a kind of a, a, a social history. So then, why am I interested in Shalom and the Cassie Hills, you might ask, if I'm an Australian urban historian? Very briefly, uh, and I think it's important to sort of situate myself. Um, my interest stems from my family and my uh, grandmother was born around here in the 1890s, in fact in 1891, uh, and she uh, was the uh, granddaughter of Thomas Jones. So Thomas Jones, the missionary, is my mother's, mother's father's father. So this is a history even in a faraway place like Australia, you might think, how does this professor of history get interested in this place? That's my connection. And so while I've spent a lot of my career writing about urban history, some years ago I thought, I need, I need to understand this history personally, but I sort of turned it into also a professional interest and deeper scholarship around uh, the role of the missionaries, the impact of colonialism, intercultural exchange, and what kind of legacies um, have been left. So that, that book, Welsh Missionaries and British Imperialism, uh, was published uh, by Manchester University Press uh, a few years ago now, uh, which is effectively a kind of a, a history of Thomas Jones particularly and the early years of the, uh, the, the, the missionaries in the Cussie Hills. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a few examples from that in my, in my talk. And that has also led me on to, in, in, in saying to myself, if I need to understand uh, Thomas Jones, and, and, and to understand Thomas Jones, I need to understand the nature of British colonialism here. In doing that, I've learned more and more, and I'm still learning, about that, um, particularly that 19th century history, which has led me into, again, this connection that Professor Kainofan was talking about with, with place, with culture uh, and, and, and with Shillong itself. And while the origins of the Welsh mission were down at Sorrow, North Saudi, uh, obviously Shillong and the creation of, of Shillong as a British headquarters in the 1860s uh, is, is a very important part of this, of this history. So I've become more interested in Shillong and I'm currently working on uh, a book uh, which will be really looking partly at the history of Shillong from that 1860s period uh, through till about 
perhaps the First World War of the 1920s. Um, being a micro-historian, being a social historian, um, things take a very long time. Uh, books, books take 10 years to research deeply and to, and to think carefully about and to come to the places that you're writing about. That's another important, I think, theme and mantra of my work. You can't write about a place that you've never been to. You have to engage with that place. You have to go there, you have to walk around, you have to meet people, talk to them, become authentically engaged. And that's not always easy, uh, particularly when you're an outsider. I have this sort of odd insider-outsider connection here, as, as I think you, 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 you would glean. Um, but I think that, that sort of sense of, of place is tremendously important. And I'm, I'm, so that's what I'm working away on, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, some of uh, the other projects that I work on um, towards the end. I'm going to start, though, thinking about the historian's craft. Just put up that word, historicise. And I often say to my students, you know, his history is not a dinner party conversation. You know, it's not just about sitting around a table saying, oh, you know, I think this, I think that, this is my opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we, if we want to think of ourselves as professional, critical historians, we have to think about what that word historicise means. And it's about not just sort of reading things backwards, but reading things forwards as well, historically, putting ourselves in, in, in the place and time of the past without the, the knowledge that we have about what happened. You know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, the future wasn't yet uh, revealed and there were choices and pathways that it could have taken. And our job is to get our, get our, you know, get our, our facts and figures right, but also get, get closer to the mindset, the mentality of people in the past in order to see and understand what choices they made that have, that have produced the future. And as a historian of colonialism, I don't see, uh, I don't see colonialism in, in, in that very stereotyped way of it's all bad or it's all good. It's, it's, it's a complicated Thing, as I'm sure you uh, will be interested to um, to talk about, and I'm sure you think about. Um, so I think rather than saying <coughs> judging a historical character by who they are, are they? And, and this applies not just to colonial, this applies to anyone in the past. You know, are they a politician? Are they a soldier? Are they a missionary? Are they a you know? And and then thinking, oh, well, therefore they will think this. That's not always the case. Uh, and of course, people in the past uh, are not um, cardboard cutout sort of figures. They're also complex, like we are complex, like you are complex. Your motivations, your histories, your knowledge. And also, you can you change your mind too. Just think, you know, how you might have changed your mind about things. People in the past changed their mind about things too. So it's important to track people over their, over their lives and see how they um, develop and change. Now I haven't got my long distance glasses on, but um, you might be able to read some of those. So, historicise is about situating in historical context, um, in a particular place, in a particular time, to interpret something as a product of historical development. And we shouldn't think of the past as being you know, onwards and upwards, it's sort of in the, the process of getting better and improving what, what's called the Whiggish view of history. Things go up and down, sometimes things go backwards before they go forwards. Um, so again, thinking about chronology carefully. And I've written there, trans, transitive. So historicise as a transitive verb, we historicise things or events or processes. And my example is one from Melbourne. We have every year a, uh, a ceremony on, uh, in April called the Anzac Day, and it's a, it's a national holiday, and it commemorates the First World War 
and the involvement of Australian and New Zealand uh, uh, military in the First World War campaign. And I say to my students, yeah, now, it, now it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, popular celebration. It, 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 people pay respect. There are big marches and commemorations and so on. Uh, but I'd say to my students, when I, was a, when, when I was a student, when I was their age in the early 1980s, we actually didn't um, go around wrapping ourselves in Australian flags and being, having sort of a more nationalist approach to it. Anzac Day was very contested. It was a time when it was, uh, you know, we're going back in the sort of post-Vietnam War um, kind of decades. Uh, there was a lot of critique of war. There was a lot of criticism of war. There were a lot of debates about, uh, you know, the gender impacts, the violence against women in war and so on. And, you know, when I was at university, we used to go on, on sort of protests about these things. And when I tell my students this, they, they, they can't believe it. They, they, they think that Anzac Day has always been the same, but it has a, it, it has a history itself. And you could probably think of particular events or festivals or commemorations here that you could start to historicise. And then, and, and then the historian's challenge is then, well, what, what does that mean? How, how has it changed? And without giving a lecture about Anzac Day here, we, we you know, the short answer is, there's been a change in understandings of trauma. So, for example, when the, the, the soldiers from Vietnam came back to Australia, they were, they were derided by the public. They didn't get some big heroes welcome, because that war was very contested, why we, we should be there in the first place. Whereas in the 1980s, there came to be an understanding that, that, um, that service personnel themselves were kind of victims in war and had, had traumatic experiences. And it became, there became this sort of acknowledgement of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, um, and, and the, the individual accounts and experiences of, of, of military people were, were uh, given more sympathetic attention that's, that's just one little aspect of, of how this has changed. There are other, other reasons, but that's what we mean by historicise. And then we, we talk about historical thinking and what that means. Um, and I won't dwell too much on this because I don't want to have you here all day, but I think, I think here's some of the kind of key, key um, aspects of what do we mean by historical thinking. It's about, it's about thinking critically about source material. What's the difference between a primary source and a secondary source? The more sources that we have, the more different perspectives that we'll, that we'll have. And it's the historian's job to really seek them out um, carefully um, and analyse uh, these in, um, in, in careful ways. Look at multiple accounts and perspectives. I do a little experiment with my students in, in the lecture theatre uh, and I, I pre-arrange for someone to come in about five minutes into the lecture and have a little conversation with me. Oh, you know, Professor May, I'm looking for the, the, the chemistry lecture. And I said, no, no, you've got the wrong room and off they go. At the end of the lecture, I say to the students, take out a piece of paper and write an account of what happened when that person came into the room. And they all think, oh yeah, that's pretty obvious. And I say, write down what time did they come in? What did, what did they say? What were they wearing? And they write it down. And I say, okay, screw that piece of paper up into, into a ball. On the count of three, I want you to throw it into the air. One, two, three, and I throw the piece of paper in the air. Then I say, get into a little group and pick up three pieces of paper and write me a history, write me a, a, an account of what happened only based on, not what you think you saw, but only based on what's written on those pieces of paper. Well, some people say the person came in at five past, some say ten past, some say they had a watch on their left hand, some say on their right hand, you know. And the lesson there is, if we can't get an accurate account of what happened half an hour ago, what challenges do we have about something that happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago? 500 years ago. These, these are the sorts of challenges that I'm talking about. So that's 
sort of by way of, of, of preface, but I think to just set the scene for you as, as students and scholars about, you know, what is a historical approach and uh, what, are, what, what are some of the ways that we need to think about is history as a discipline. I'm going to talk mainly about what I'm calling the colonial archive. And, uh, and I'm going to reflect a bit later on about you know, the, complexity, the complexities of this um, and the, the need for collaboration. I'm a historian uh, who's very interested in this part of the world, but I don't speak Kasi, I don't read Kasi. Uh, I, I don't know the the, the, the stories, the, the, the local history, the local knowledge, the law, some of the folklore that, that, that Bar Desmond is a, is a fount of knowledge of. That's not my speciality, but I'm not for a moment saying that's not a critical part of writing history. So I, I, it's a kind of a preface to what I'm going to be talking about because I do acknowledge the critical importance of the history of this place is your history. And what that means is too that there's an obligation of those stories and those histories to be written and engaged with as I know they are uh, here. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is, is my attempt to find and interpret history, that the colonial history of this place in what I'm calling the colonial archive. And as I guess the title suggests it's 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 a place, the physical places often in the UK that have been involved in the administration, uh, the documentation of uh, of uh, colonies across the world. But we're talking about India, particularly, obviously, prior to 1947. And what what can we learn from these archives? Uh, how do we how can we read between the lines of that dominant colonial mindset that we can critique and we need to critique. But what we can what can we find in these archives that's that's perhaps more interesting than that that can help us understand the dynamics of the past. So again I, I, I preface my remarks here that a lot of what we find in these archives is culturally absolutist. It's it's, it's, it's racist, it's ignorant, uh, it's, it, it, it uh, has huge gaps, it elides, it, it misses out on, obviously, local understandings of identity, of agency, uh, and we need to read it between the lines of what we would call a hegemonic archive. Uh, and, and that's what I set myself as my challenge. I don't, I don't speak or read Kasi, but I can read these archives, and I go in there looking. I go in there looking to try and read between the lines <coughs> of these um, of these histories. I'm going to give you a few examples of the sorts of things uh, that I mean here. Here, here are some, a few slides of things that I found in the colonial archive um, about um, Cherpunji, Sora. The British station there. Uh, for those of you who I'm sure know the history of this era from the 1820s onwards, the British moving in uh, in the immediate aftermath of the first Anglo Burmese War to establish um, military control, to have a, a road built over the hills, uh, and the sanitarium and, and military station. That Chirapunji and the role of uh, David Scott, the political agent. So this is the era that we're talking about. And so I've, I've been, you know, obviously in order to understand what Thomas Jones was doing when he arrived here in 1841, I needed to get a sense of, of, this, of this history um, and this kind of micro historical approach. And part of my methodology here has been to sort of gather from these archives, um, you know, from this small, at this point, British station at, at, at uh, Cherrapunji from the 1820s to the 1860s, which is the focus of my first book. And 
one of the methodologies that I use is called prosopography. It's a term you, you, you may have come across. Look it up, prosopography. And this is, to me, this is a really useful micro-historical method. And prosopography is really looking at a kind of uh, in individual people and their careers and their networks, um, their families, their connections, what jobs they did, uh, in a kind of interrelated way. And then you can start to see patterns emerging. So, you know, if you, if you analysed all the, uh, all, all the military people stationed here, how old they were and where they came from, what their experience was, whatever, you, you, you start to get an understanding of what was sort of normal. And then you can also get a sense of what is exceptional. So you take a group, a group analysis, you, start, you can start to read these patterns. And then you can understand a little better how individual people behave uh, in that context. So I've delved into the archives, looking at the role of the military, of scientists, botanists, uh, of, of, of commercial interests, uh, and so on. And this, this demands this intense struggle with the documentary stories. And what, what I'd also encourage you as students to, to do, and it's not always easy, and it's not always something that is, let's say, permitted, either as a student or as a senior academic getting work published, is uh, it's, it's not betraying our careful methodology or our objectivity to express in your history writing what position you're writing from, what struggles you have with, this, with the sources. This is not about sort of writing up a perfect account of facts and figures and this is what happened. It's also about engaging the past in the present. And I, I mean, I partly say to my students, it's the kind of so what question. But why do we care about this stuff? And that's very much about the present. So when I write, my history, I need, I need to tell my reader my position. It, it would actually be disingenuous of me not to, because I, I do have a subject position, I have a relationship to this material. Um, but I think also that sense of, of the, the kind of detective trail that we use when we're researching. You, you find some great things, but you go looking for other things and you never find them. You don't leave that out of your history writing, you tell your reader about the gaps. And sometimes the gaps are as interesting as the things that you find. You know, why hasn't someone ever written about this? You know, the elephant in the room kind of metaphor. And, and suddenly that can help you understand um, uh, things that are missing in, in the texts. So my work's very much shaped by what I, what I find, but also what I can't find. And so you could call it the kind of inscrutability of the sources. And a lot of the sources I'm using are fragmentary. You know, they're collections of correspondence or letters that are, that are missing bits. You know, where the things crossed out or they're torn pages. And you've got to try and read between the lines. And I'll talk about that uh, in a minute in relation to some of the, the, the Welsh missionary material. And I guess the, the, the message there is okay to be puzzled by history. I'm also guided by the work of many other historians of, of imperialism and, and, and empire. Of course, I come from a, another settler colonial country. Australia was invaded by the British in the late 18th century, and they just took the indigenous lands of the Aboriginal people. And to this day, that is still an unreconciled part of our history. So, you know, I think, and, and that kind of, you know, partly, Again, that's been helpful for me to look at different types of kind of colonial processes, and you learn different things from different contexts. They're all they're all sort of different uh, in their own particular ways. Um, but I think that 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 sort of broader scholarship about empire and colonialism in different contexts is certainly important to read because it is, um, you know, it's fractured, it's riddled with contradictions, and it's daunting. It's intellectually daunting to get your head around, but that's okay. So I've been talking about the colonial archive, you know, what 
I'll feed just a few other uh, images of uh, Cherrapunchi from Henry Yule, uh, his maps, uh, survey maps in the 1840s. Uh, you know, photographs and photo albums are particularly interesting to me, and uh, I'll give you an example in a minute too. Of um, you know, a lot of a lot of this this what I would call uh, you know, critical cultural material is still you know, filed away in these colonial archives in the UK. And it's very difficult to get hold of them. It's very difficult to get permission from the, the colonial archive, you know, um, uh, gatekeepers to disseminate this information. And that's another interesting question about, you know, repatriation and digital ownership. I mean, to me, this image doesn't belong in the British Library. It belongs here with the, with the people who who are related to, to these to these women. Um, so I spent a lot of time going through these uh, these types of things. So as, so he, he, you know you might think what are these other types that that he's talking about? They, they, in the last sort of 25, 30 years, these are the archives that I've visited that I can remember that contain the sort of material that I mentioned in as Hampstead Archives. I was there in in March this year. The, the Mission Archive at the National Library of Wales from 1841 until, if I remember correctly, about 1967 or so, so I think the, the last Welsh missionaries left. Huge archive, huge archive with, with important material from this area. The Cambridge South Asia Archive, the Devonshire Collection at Chatsworth. I'm going to give you an example of why that's interesting. Dr. Graham's Homes at Callum Pong, India Office Records of the British Library, Kew Gardens Archive in London, National Archives of India, National Archives UK, National Library of Scotland, the Native Memorial Library in New Delhi, Nottingham University, SOAS in London, Senate House Library in London, West Bengal State Archives, some of these archives are in India, of course, newspapers, important, private collections, and recently I went to the Gorka Archives in Winchester, which of course you know there were Gorka regiments stationed here in Shillong, incredible material there, photo albums of, uh, going back historically. So this is a sample of the, of the sorts of places that I've been, and there are many others, that contain information about this place. Uh, this was a recent visit I made to the Assam State Archive, and this, just again to give you an idea of the sort of material that I'm talking about. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on uh, at the moment is looking at the role of the labour companies from the northeast of India in the First World War. So there were there were groups of labourers from. Garo Hills, Kasi, across the northeast, uh, Manipur, Burma, and so on, who were sent over to France in the First World War to perform labour, build railways, and and, and, and so on. Uh, and there, there's incredible material in the Assam archive still that's that's that, that still to be uh, processed about the story of that, about the experiences of those men. Uh, here's a uh, an image from a, a British passport from the early part of the 20th century of a, a tea planter who's applying to, I think, go back to the UK with a, with a, with a photograph of the buyer who was looking after his children, who also went to the UK with him. But you know, here's a photograph. Of that, of that woman. This, you know, this is about seek, seeking these lives of individual people, even though this is in a very kind of colonial archive context and what can we find and what can we learn. I also found this map of Shillong in March uh, in the SM archive, and I'll talk about that at the end of the project we're working on at the moment. Um, but again, really important material that's, that's, that's buried away. This is, this is Chatsworth, a grand uh, house in Devonshire. Uh, 
in the 19th century, in the, in the 1830s, all of the aristocrats in the UK were competing with each other for who could have the grandest gardens and who could, who could source the most exotic plants. And so the Duke of Devonshire, whose head gardener was Joseph Paxton, who ended up being the designer of the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851, that great glass construction in London. He was the head gardener here, and he, he, he was a, one of the first sort of designers of, of the greenhouse concept. So what did they do? They sent a young fellow called John Gibson. So this is 1836 or so. They sent him to church on a ship to bring back <coughs> orchids and exotic plants. So the correspondence that he writes back from Cherubunji and the correspondence between Paxton and the Duke of Devonshire and so on is all in this archive and just contains, so there we go, there's a letter from Cherubunji in the 1830s. There's some of the old greenhouses that are still there. That's the, that's the greenhouse, it's no longer on the grounds, but that was the, that was the greenhouse in the 19th century on the grounds. And of course, these were the sorts of... So in these letters, we get, we get evidence of not only this sort of colonial project and ideology to kind of send these people out across the empire, it wasn't just India, and kind of, you know, pillage all the, uh, you know, natural and, 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 and cultural objects, but we get a sense of their, their mindset and why they're doing it. But also in some of these letters, we learn things, we get clues to the, to the past uh, in some of this correspondence. There's material in family collections. This is one I tracked down some years ago from a family who, the most curious thing, um, I'd arranged to meet a woman I'd never met uh, in London, in a park, on a park bench, not in, not in, a, not in a university or in, a, in an archive, but I corresponded with her online, and she said, yes, I've got some material, I'll meet you on a park bench, and she brought up a shoebox with old family letters. And she was a descendant uh, of uh, Emma Shadwell, who was the wife of John Bird Shadwell, who was an assistant political agent uh, at um, Cherokee in this period. And they lived, uh, so you can see Cherokee, these are letters from the 1860s, there's a little pressed leaf in the letter. Um, so the fam this family lived here, lived at uh, right down the end, uh, down, for those who know Soto, right down at the end, uh, and the old ruins of that family cemetery are still there. But in, the, in these letters was a huge amount of incredible sort of, uh, again, not just information about the British mindset, and that, that's important too, but just think, you know, local events, things that were happening there at the time. Um, and we, we have this because, uh, as often with the British at that period, um, they sent their children back to England when they were uh, young. So Emma Shadwell, they sent their three children back, and in fact she never saw them again. She, she died in July. Uh, and there's the correspondence between the mother and the daughter. That's what the... They, they look like they're hard, they're hard to read. This is part of the historian's job to read, get used to reading, handwriting. Here's some examples, you know, a cholera outbreak uh, in the prison. You know, that's, that's fascinating. You know, this is all, you know, if we think about epidemiology and pandemic and previous histories of, of, of plague and disease, th this sort of things are quite in important to, um, to glean from archives. So we can certainly, we can certainly place Emma uh, and her husband in, and I'll talk about, a bit about John Bird Shadwell in another context in a minute, we can put them in the context of British control and authority, but at an individual level we can read between the lines here and get some really interesting information. She, she talks about the, the local practice of 
setting fire to the grass on the plateau seasonally uh, as, a, as, a, as a local management practice. That's, that's really interesting. She talked about, talks about the tigers coming up from the, from the ravines. So we just get a sense of, uh, you know, for those interested in environmental history, ecological history, sort of data is important. So we've got a great variety of texts, um, genres, government papers, call records, photographs, petitions, and we, you know, we need to be, we need to be, part of my sort of message, if, if, if I can put it like that today, is we need to be attentive to the things that are not in what we could call the canon, you know, not, not in the textbooks, not in the canonical texts. They're important, but what if you detail it or theoretically, we have a few examples. Um, I don't, I can't see a clock from where I am, so I, I do have a tendency I can, I can talk all day and hopefully um, uh, if I see people falling asleep, I know it's time to, to wind it up, but do, um, do, do give me sort of a five or ten minute warning if, if I do go on too long. Um, I want to give a few examples from my work to, to, to go in a bit more deep and explore some of the points I, I've made. Here, here's the only known image of Thomas Jones, and I, I, I only saw this image for the first time uh, in uh, the late 1990s in a book written by a uh, Welsh, a Welsh um, writer, Nigel Jenkins, which was one of the first books in Wales to sort of popularise and re-examine the, the, the history and impact of the Welsh tradition uh, in the hills. And I mentioned before it's important not to sort of think of people by their their roles. Not whether whether good or bad, I'm not taking I'm not taking a moral judgment here, I'm just saying if you if you say you know, a missionary is like this or a soldier is like that, or you know, a commercial agent is like whatever. Sure, they, they have roles within the imperial um, network and process, but they, they act differently in different situations. So one of, one of Thomas Jones's, it might be surprising to, to hear that one of Thomas Jones's big supporters was uh, a local uh, British judge who was based in Silhet by the name of Henry Stainforth. Now there are all sorts of complexities to this, and of course when we talk about British, with you know, there's, a, there's been a new sort of turn over the past years in, in British colonial history called the Four Nations approach. So British is not a monolithic category because there's English and there's Welsh and there's Irish and there's Scots and they actually all have different, different approaches, different roles, different experiences. So we can't kind of always say British or Britishers are all the same. They're, they're not, they, they, they often come uh, at a different. So in, in Thomas Jones, he found someone who kind of accorded with, even though he was a kind of, he was a legal person, he wasn't a missionary, he wasn't, a, you know, there for religious proselytising, but he was a, he, he was ideologically sympathetic with Thomas Jones. And in fact, they went, they went as a business together uh, and they had a farm. Uh, and they, um, they, they bred horses and they traded in cinnamon and honey and rubber. And Thomas Jones, uh, this is after he was expelled from the mission, was the manager of that, uh, of that farm. So when, right at the end of Thomas Jones's life in 1849, when he was, he was declared a rebel by the, the British government for being a supporter of the Kasi people and standing up for the abuses that they were experiencing in the, through the, some of the British commercial interests, Stainford stood up for him. So not all the Britishers thought the same. And he wrote, I'll quote from this letter, I wish it to be understood that I do not assert Mr Jones to be immaculate. I know that he's been indiscreet and intemperate, but I also know he's beloved by the Kassis and that he has endeavoured to do them and the government good service in attempting to liberate the former from oppression and the latter from contempt. So this is one little example of uh, getting under the, under, under the 
the, the skin of, of, of what people really thought and did rather than just who, who they are. <clears throat> One of the things I do find interesting in the colonial archive is the lack, the lack of the lack of description, and even in the mission archive, about um, local cultural practices. It's something that happens probably a bit, a bit later than this period. But again, even if we if we if we get through the biases and and you know. To be honest, at times, some of the offensive language that we find in these documents, we can still find interesting material about local um, practices. <coughs> As I say, the mission archive is, is is full of this sort of material. <coughs> Harking back to what I, was, what I was talking about before about the about photographs. Um, I had the privilege yesterday of um, being taken out to uh, Nongkanum dance with Bar Desmond and I'd never, I'd not attended that event before, so it was a very special moment for me. But some years ago, if you look at that image, I found that image in the British Library, hidden away in a photo album that's never been really seen or reproduced. That is of the Nongkrim dance in the 1890s. And there are all sorts of fascinating comparisons and continuities as well as, cha as changes. So in 2017, I took that out uh, to uh, Smith uh, and I met the CM and I uh, presented him with a copy of that photograph, and it's a, it, a photograph that they had never seen, and was of, a, of immense interest <coughs> to them. Uh, and there, there, there were a couple of other photos too, and they, they recognised people in these in these photos. Um, so to me, again, it's not just about writing textbooks or complex theoretical articles about colonialism. It's actually there's a practical side to this, which is about connection, which is about, I would call this a kind of a repatriation of, of material and, and a connecting of communities to materials about them and, and that kind of, again, to use Bardesi's term, a, a, a confluence, a, a collaboration. I'm going to switch focus and talk a little bit about language. I mentioned that uh, I don't speak Hussey, I don't speak Welsh either. Uh, my grandmother spoke Hussey and Welsh, uh, but unfortunately we were not blessed with um, keeping that language uh, in our family. But the point I want to make here is that we can't, or we can't always assume, and I think you've got a sense of that Stainforth Jones relationship, we can't always assume that the colonial archive itself is devoid of its own internal power dynamics. And this is a really good example. So here we've got uh, Thomas Jones comes to the hills in 1841, he dies in Calcutta in 1849, he never goes back. But the mission uh, committee is actually based in Liverpool, where there's a, a, a Welsh community. So there's a whole set of correspondence. So Thomas Jones writes back to the committee and says, this is what I've been doing, this is what's been happening. The committee write back to him with instructions or comments. Uh, you know, he, he, he's the sort of man on the ground um, and starts to kind of, I think, act in a way that's probably a bit more um, freestyling than the mission body wanted uh, because he feels that he can make the decisions more appropriately here. So this is a really interesting correspondence to look at the dynamic uh, around, um, around this. Now Thomas Jones, he, he did speak Welsh, absolutely, and he could, he, he could clearly write Welsh as well, but he always wrote his letters in English. So when he wrote to John Roberts, the secretary, John Roberts would then translate the letters into Welsh 
and he would often say to Thomas Jones, can you please write in Welsh so, so I don't have to translate the letters? And why did he translate the letters into Welsh to publish them in the missionary journal, the Drzorba? And it sort of puzzled me for a long time. Why, why, you know, why did Thomas Jones write in Welsh? Why is John Roberts a bit cross that he has to re-translate re these, these letters? And it, it, it dawned on me that this was about the, the place of the Welsh in Liverpool at this time. The Welsh were a migrant community and they wanted to assert their Welsh identity. So using their own language was a critical part of that. And we know how important our own languages are. And we know how important it is when people won't let us acknowledge or speak those languages. So the, Wel the Welsh had a similar sense of kind of this sort of, you know, pride in their origins, in their culture, and they wanted to produce things in Welsh. So that uh, explained to me that that sort of socio-political context in, in Liverpool uh, actually uh, led me to understanding this, this, this debate that they were having about um, that language. And then the, uh, so of course, because Thomas Jones was a controversial figure to the mission, because he was expelled in the mid-1840s, when I, when I go to the mission archive in Wales, none of his, none of his letters exist anymore. They've, 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 they threw him away. They tried to write him out of their history. Whereas of the later missionaries, William Lewis and, and many others, there are substantial files of their correspondence. So all I, all I have of Thomas Jones's letters are Welsh translations of English originals that no longer exist, that I, that I have had to get a Welsh translator to translate back into English, and they're full of uh, arcane, uh, you know, 19th century Welsh is not the same as contemporary Welsh, language changes, as you, you know, and I had to get a specialist translator who understood not only that sort of high literary style of Welsh, but also all the biblical allusions and so on. So there are layers of translation and back translation and so on. And of course, you know, there are slippages of meaning and, and we know the complexity of translation. So my job's been, again, to sort of try and read between the, the lines of that. And then there are all sorts of discussions between, um, between Jones um, and um, uh, and Roberts about, about these issues. And there are problems of interpretation in the Welsh words. So in Welsh, the word merch can mean daughter, girl, or woman. So it doesn't always tell you what age the person being written about uh, is, uh, is meant. Um, Bachgen can mean boy, but it can also refer to men. Mab can refer to sons, but also men generally. So, you know, when we're trying to translate these back into English, it's really difficult. Um, and of course, the Welsh themselves weren't particularly good, particularly in the early years, when they didn't really have a good knowledge of local culture. Um, they often had trouble um, estimating the age of, of custody. As well, so th these these are some of the, the the challenges. So finding finding Kasi voices in the archive, and remember that this is a period of, of oral tradition before the, the missionary education bore fruits later in the century. Um, so some of the earliest earliest archival material that I found actually written by Kasi is Ula Sin, who was an evangelist who uh, went to Wales in 1861, uh, accompanied some of the missionaries there, and uh, is a really in in interesting character. I won't go
go into it in detail. But just this, this um, again, I, I think he was born in Mouse Mai, uh, and he, he wrote letters back to his family, and some of these letters are in, in the archive, written in English. And he, you know, we often think about the, the colonialists sort of talking about uh, India, but this is a great example of Akasi going to England and talking about how he finds the English country. Uh, fantastic descriptions. England is a flat country, having only a few little hills there, here and there. But Wales is a mountainous country. He's writing this to one of his relatives. It's like your Jantia country in many parts, and in some parts like our Kasi country. And these cultural comparisons, fascinating. The land, of, the land of the country is not extremely better than the Jantia country, but the industry and perseverance of the people are very great indeed. There's not much of jungle, and there's no part of the country without being cultivated. All the rivers glide smoothly and pleasantly along as if they were silver snakes. But they do not dig the earth away and sink deeply like our rivers in the Kasi country. When I, am, when I am in Wales, I feel on this account just as if I were in my own Kasi country. But when I am in England, I feel as if I were in Bengal. Fascinating, again, insight into many things. So he, can't, you know, he experiences going to Wales partly as a kind of homecoming to the origin of the mission, uh, but also obviously as, a bit, as an exile, he's away from his country. Uh, and of course, very sadly, he, he, uh, he died in 1863 in Chester uh, and never came back. Later, later in the century, so uh, once educa Kasi's educated in English started then writing back to the mission, we start to see some of the origins of, and I think you can track this sort of into the, the, uh, the, the, the later part of the 19th century of the rise of the Senkasi and that, that sense of local identity in the face of the, of the, of the missionary. Fascinating period. The Rikasi Press is founded. We start getting material printed in Kasi language. These are all sources that are incredibly uh, important. And the, the missionaries are a bit taken aback by this, but suddenly there, there are Kasi Christians writing to the secretary in Wales saying, hey, you know, we've got some complaints about the way things are being managed here. And the missionaries back home are going, well, you know, uh, don't get too ahead of yourselves, like we're still, we're still running the show. It, it's really interesting tensions start appearing in fractures. And the Kasi's rightly is saying, well, you know, we have a right to our opinions and our judgment, um, but the missionaries still have a very paternalistic sense of those power uh, relationships. And that kind of material is fascinating. Uh, Another example, uh, I won't rehearse the story uh, again. Uh, we were talking in the car before about uh, Thomas Jones's role in Kasi literature. And I, I, always, I very, always very much avoid saying that Thomas Jones is the father of <coughs> Kasi literature. I think that's a big stretch. He clearly played a role in the transition from oral to written language. But if you read Thomas Jones's letters, he, he's very clear himself about how this happened. And he talks about how he, he hired a couple of local men to help him learn, learn the language. And they co-produced uh, the, the written language. And he talks about this sort of interplay I recite English words to them. They say the corresponding words in the Kasi language. After I've grasped how to pronounce them, I write them down in alphabetical order. Uh, so it's not Thomas Jones, the father of Kasi literature. It, it, it's a co-production. It's, it's a much more complicated imbrication. The lang language is critically important. And language, language is, you know, fascinating in, in many other ways. Um, 
Language is at the heart of, of power and influence and culture. Uh, when you think about even the choices about what vernacular becomes the, the lingua uh, franca. Um, and I really love looking through the archives, finding examples of outbursts or of tantrums or of emotion expressed, because that helps me understand where people are coming from and what they think uh, is important. And this terrific material, again, and, and other scholars are working, of course, on this, but the Grierson's Linguistic Survey of India, really interesting correspondence between uh, Grierson and his informants, uh, local informants here, often missionaries, also some of the uh, colonial uh, players, about how they were going to sort of fix what proper Kasi was. And discussion is there about we need to we need to have this sort of perfect, beautiful, well-developed standard of language. And all the other dialects, we don't care about them, they're not important and they're all gonna die out. So again, it's real cultural absolutism about about um, you know the importance of in, in, or, or their ideological attitudes to uh, I guess you call it you know, linguistic imperialism. Uh, so it's critical uh, to, to, to look at those sort of things. I think I'll probably talk for 10 minutes more. Is that, are we on track? That's good. I found a, a fascinating example of, uh, of language was Thomas Jones in the latter part of his life would write he was sort of in hiding uh, with his family, and there was thugs being sent uh, by, the, by some of the British interests, particularly Harry Inglis and, and, and the, um, uh, the, the Lister, the, the um, uh, Inglis's father-in-law, down at the, from the court at Sora to try and basically tell Thomas Jones to stop this rabble-rousing. So he, 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 these petitions are in the, in the British colonial records um, and fant fantastic example of uh, Thomas Jones writing um, and I, I guess using language as a kind of, uh, not just a vehicle to communicate but also a kind of authority that he felt he'd been given to speak for the Cassis. So he went to Natiang and uh, the people there dictated a petition complaining against the interference with their privileges of electing uh, head men uh, and the, the, inter the interference of the British authorities who imprisoned uh, one, of, one of their, their head people. And Thomas Jones wrote that the, the people held Tom, put their hands on Thomas Jones's pen as he wrote the petition. And what, an, what an incredible image of, I guess, a sense of, of trust and authorising him to speak on their behalf. Little tiny snippets in the archives. The colonial records are um, also, you know, again, fascinating information that we're still, we're still kind of grappling with and trying to interpret. The Nuklau Massacre in the 1820s, a lot of incredible accounts still uh, in hard to read handwriting of witness statements and evidence um, that was given uh, in the state. Uh, they, they called lots of witnesses. And, um, despite the colonial context, this gives us snippets of information about some of the power dynamics of what was going on here. Another um, really fascinating example to me is court records. And, th and this, this is an example of how it's hard to trust the colonial records sometimes. You know, it's because we read something in, in a record doesn't mean it's true. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a true thing in the sense that it was written and it's in, in a particular cultural context, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the facts are true. So, 
here is um, a, a, a transcription of a question in an inquiry. And you don't need to read the detail of it because the point I'm making is a general one. There's the answer of one of the particular Cassie witnesses. And there's the answer of the second Cassie witness. And it pretty well exactly the same, word for word. So then you've got to say, well, they didn't, they didn't say, this is concocted, this, this is just a fabrication, this pretense of having an inquiry. But the British weren't that interested in what the Cassie people were really saying. Um, but you could, you know, you, you could at first, at, at, at first thought think, oh, okay, here's some, here's some testimony. But it's much more complex than that. And the role of court interpreters is also really interesting. And some of the court interpreters, including John Burke Shadwell, were later criticised in some of the British inquiries for um, being bribed and, um, and, and, and transcribing incorrect things that would suit um, the, the, the British. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, one of the one of the other interesting things that I'm interested in is this again in humanising. When I say humanising, I don't mean glossing over. I mean understanding individual colonial people in their context. And some of them, some of them, if you think of it on a spectrum, some of them are much more sympathetic, empathetic, and active in their relationships with local people. And I think Thomas Jones is a good example of that. You know, there are other people. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got really hardline, you know, violent, abusive colonial people as well. But in the middle, there's a really interesting collection of people who sort of veer in one way or the other. You know, David Scott is maybe one example. You know, there's a lot of talk about um, his sort of, during the Nong Nong Thai massacre, about his, his sort of connect connections and, and so on, and, and, and his sort of empathy with, with, with the Kasi people. And he, he was criticised by the authorities as getting too close to the Kasi's. I mean, I'm not holding David Scott up as some paragon of, 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 of empathy, uh, but um, as a result of what his, see, his superiors saw as, as him getting too friendly, that was followed by a massive, heavy-handed assault on the Kasi people after that when Tirot Singh, you know, uh, uh, went to ground and that whole period. Um, so it's interesting to, to look at individual people and not to say, oh, they, they always behave in this way, but to, to look at it in a more complex way. Um, Thomas Lewin, not, not from, from these parts, is also an interesting fellow, but I'm not going to um, go into him at the moment. So now kind of head towards uh, the conclusion. Uh, there's there's a, a few, um, again, photos that I found recently, some of which have been reproduced, but some not, uh, from the, the Gorka archive in, uh, uh, in Winchester. So, what, what can we conclude about colonial archives? They're, they're clearly evidence of this British colonial imperial subjugation control of this region. But they're not passive repositories. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're things that are not, I can put it this way, they're, they're a source for history, but they're a subject of history as well. <coughs> That's the clearest way I can put it. So they're not just things that we mine for information, they're things that we need to critique uh, as, as the subject of what, of what we, we do critically uh, as historians. So I'll end with, uh, firstly, to sort of segue back to the start, um, and I don't mean, mean this as a sort of a, 
um, apologia, but I know sometimes, and I gave a talk here in March uh, where I focused very much on um, a particular draft chapter of the book I'm working on, the British here, and at the end of it I had some really good questions, but one person said, I was very disappointed in your talk because you didn't give the Kasi perspective. And I think that's uh, perfectly reasonable uh, uh, response. And I guess my reflection is where I started, that this is a, this has to be a kind of collaboration when we're dealing with these complex sets of material, when we're co-producing history, which is why it's so exciting for me and rewarding to be collaborating with scholars here. And that's a critical part of what I do. Uh, and I try and find the Kasi people in these heavily biased documents and read between the lines and find their, their voices. But I can't tell the this, this story from a Kasi perspective. That's for you guys. But we can, we can collaborate and learn things from, from each other. And that's the, you know, the power of history is recognising our own limitations, um, but also recognising, I mean, for a start, oral history, oral folklore is as important a source for history as these documents. And that's not something I love talking about, but there are other people who are far more expert uh, than I. And I, whenever I have conversations with Bart Desmond, every time I learn something fascinating and important. So, a visual way to, to sort of say what I try and do is, this was a photo I found in March again uh, uh, of the Britishers here uh, in Shillong. All in their finery and all, you know, uh, it was a special event, I think, for Lady Ward, the, the Chief Commissioner's wife, and the Wards were leaving Shillong and she was presented, because she used to keep the score at the cricket matches, she was presented with a silver inkwell. This is a photo of that event. So I'm quite interested in all the sort of power dynamics and ideologies of these British people, what they thought they were doing and what they did. But this to me is as interesting. You know, this window where we can see some local figures, who are they, what are they doing? They're looking down on this scene. They have a different, they have a different vision. They're looking at this, in, a, in, a, in, a, in their own way. And if I go through all the photos that I find in the archives, here's suddenly they're all cussing people, local people. Uh, they're not the subject of these photos, they're always in the background or on the fringes. But I think this is a good, symbolically for me, this is what we try and do with these colonial sources, is to, is to recognise <coughs> The, 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 the local perspective and ensure that we don't lose sight of, the, of, of, of these voices. Two quick uh, things to finish with. Uh, again, it will probably be a couple of years before I finish that book, book, book on, on the next sort of uh, volume of history. Uh, but in the meantime, we've been collaborating on some terrific projects. One, uh, we're concluding a uh, British Library funded uh, project that uh, Professor Kamerflag is a partner on where we've been looking for uh, endangered, um, fragile documentation here that's a danger of being lost, particularly from that early period um, of, of printing. I mentioned the Rikasi Press, so some of those early Kasi language newspapers, some Christian, some, some non-Christian, and we've been copying and digitising and preserving these. And, you know, they're tremendously important. So even, even the story of, that, of the First World War I mentioned, um, I've got the perspective from mission archives from the War Office in the UK, but here's, here's a different perspective if we translate these and read them um, uh, about that experience of these, of these men leaving. So these early newspapers are critical and, and there's a lot, of, a lot more work to be done Oh, sorry. 
Uh, and the second project we're working on currently is a little pilot project on mapping. And we've created a digital <coughs> space and we're collecting and collating place-related history and heritage about Shalom and mapping that uh, and using... So this that map I found in, in, in March that I mentioned. And we've got other maps. There's a map of Shalom from 1925. Uh, and we are... And this 1940s map. And we're kind of overlaying these maps. And we're rectifying them so that the output the will be a map that you can sort of toggle between historical maps and a contemporary map. And we're locating places because they're all um, drawn up to different scale, particularly the, the older map. But we know there are places like Lord's, Lord's Lake, even though it's sort of changed shape at different times, uh, the, uh, the jail, cemetery, that are still in exactly the same place, so we can technically um, rectify these. Um, so we've selected a number of places on the 1880 map that also occur on the 1940 map and we can we can digitally uh, enhance that. I've done a lot of work in Melbourne on this sort of thing and it's exciting to be exploring it using using uh, old directory material on Shalom uh, and co-producing another resource that I think is going to be tremendously important for um, understanding the history of this past. And we do have a, a website, you can look it up, uh, sadat.omeka.net, uh, and have a look at that. And we're also, just a plug, having a bit of a, a, a hackathon event um, next Friday, the 10th, uh, where we're inviting uh, anyone who's interested to come along uh, and learn a bit more about this project. Um, and get involved in helping, helping us to develop uh, this website as a collaborative shared resource. So on that night, I've taken you on a bit of a whirlwind tour of, of my own work, um, my own sort of personal history. I hope you understand now why I can't stay away from Shalom and, and regularly come back despite the uh, interregnum of the, pan the pandemic years. Um, the excitement that I share in collaboration and being extended invitations like this to talk about uh, my work and our work is a really important part of, of me learning and sharing, uh, but also I hope you've learned a little uh, about um, some of the complexities of understanding and writing histories of, uh, of places like Shalom. So thank you very much for your really, um, I can see, patient and attentive response and I look forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you, Professor Lee, for that enlightening lecture. I now leave the room for anyone who has questions for Professor. Maybe someone could start off by telling me what you think about uh, the history of Shalom and, and how it's explored and um, the sort of resources that you think that there might be uh, that we that we need to pay attention to. Um, the volunteer, can you please give the mic to the front? The man here. Yes, I can hear you. Yep. There's a mic for me. I'm really honoured to be here. And I thank uh, the college for the invitation. Uh, Professor May, uh, if you can recall several years back, 
I don't know, maybe five or six years back, you had visited my college, Lady Kim College. Yes. And I recall uh, you had brought along with your daughter. I did, yes. 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 So this is my second time uh, listening to you. It's a real uh, privilege for me. Uh, well, there are some uh, interesting things that you have pointed out. Uh, you see, I had done my PhD and my thesis was uh, entitled uh, Emergence of Social Forces in the Khasi Jaintia Society. And then uh, at the very outset, when I did my thesis, when I submitted my synopsis, uh, I, I faced a major challenge in the sense that, uh, you know, I, uh, in my thesis, my, my, uh, I did a lot of research and then uh, I dwelt on the fact that uh, the emergence of social forces uh, wherein I, uh, you know, I projected on the emergence, uh, particularly on the emergence of the educated elite among the Hasis and Jaintias. And so there were a lot of, uh, uh, it, it stirred up a hornet's nest in the sense that there were some professors from the university, Nehu, who said that, no, you can't say that uh, these are the middle class. Uh, and then later on, uh, so I, I, I changed the, the topic from middle class to social forces. Uh, that's my topic, uh, hence. And so uh, in my findings, I, I, I concluded that uh, it was uh, the, the Khasi uh, educated middle class which emerged in the late 19th century. And uh, so these, these class of people uh, were basically from the economic background, uh, not particularly the traditional heads like the Sikkims or the Lindors, but these classes of people that emerged were mostly uh, they, they, had a, they had a good economic background and henceforth they, uh, you know, they were English educated in government schools and so therefore uh, they, uh, you know, they, they formed this class of people who today we would call them the middle class. And there's one particular point that you mentioned where you said that a fascinating material that some Khasi educated uh, started writing in English, complaining about the Welsh missionaries. So if I had added, if, if I had seen this, it would establish my argument that yes, the Hasi middle class had emerged as a result of uh, the education that they got, uh, brought in by the uh, mm. Western uh, society and the British colonial. Yep. Yep. It, it's, a, it's an important point and it's a, uh, it's actually a point that's, that's, that's made across different uh, imperial contexts. It's, it, it's often given that term, you know, the empire writes back. It's this sense of once, once uh, local people are empowered in that, in that English language context to then um, express their concerns, to petition, to write, uh, it, it does reflect, uh, I think, a sort of a, 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 a very important sort of nascent um, sort of burgeoning and sort of zero point of this, of this as you're saying, this sort of emergent, di different sort of educated middle class. Um, I mean, th th these letters that I was talking about from the 1870s, you know, they're, they're really, they're very interesting because they're, they're uh, they're formal, they're very, um, that's what I'm looking for, deferential even, but they're, they're very sure and very certain about the points that they want to make. So often they'll say, you know, we're writing to you as the, you know, originators of our mission and we, you know, uh, we pay homage to the fact that you brought these things to us, but, dot, 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 here's some of the things that we want to tell you that we want you to, to, to listen to. And I think, you know, more work could be done on that, on that material. That's not something that I, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the examples that I give, the snippets I found, and I think that, that, that archive, in, in the mission archive, you'll find many more of these, of these, of the, these types of correspondence through that period. It would be really interesting to, 
to, to look at. Um, but I think you're right. And I think that, if you call it that sort of bigger, you know, complex intellectual history of, of Shalom going through the 20th century as well is again, you know, well understood individually by various scholars who've written, you know, terrific material, but there's no kind of, there's no kind of big picture comprehensive study of that, which I think would be, you know, I mean, as I say, I'm, that being defensive, I'm an urban, urban historian, not so much an intellectual historian, but this, this is, this sort of, um, going back to what I was saying before about reading things forward and seeing how things emerge and who are the players and who are the collectives and the, the relationships between people, critically important, um, are a way of, of seeing what particular um, formations uh, emerge. And, and they're not always based on the kind of, you know, our traditional sense of even, you know, religion or ethnicity or whatever, they can, they're, they're, they're new formations. Um, so I think, I think the work that you're pointing to is still critically important and certainly happy to share any more material I find, I find. but thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I was also, uh, I have taken a lot of time, even in the state archives in Guwahati, uh, where you have yeah. projected a lot of materials there. Um, I've not been so fortunate to have visited the British archives, although I was there uh, for a couple of years. Uh, but I don't know if you have uh, gone and seen the government records room in Shillong? The no, government no. records room? No, I haven't. Even that is a storehouse of good old yeah. records. Yeah. You could yeah. get a chance. Thank you so much. Um, this uh, behind you now. So I, I'm not sure what you said, I think. That's on there. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask you, you did mention, uh, you, you're talking about how we drive out the micro from a very elitist archive, an empire's archive as such. And you talked about a couple of uh, challenges of language, of translation, and obviously the very fact that the quote-unquote native as such is always on the periphery, is on the center. What other problems do you think uh, have you personally faced uh, while trying to drive out the native in the archive? And how have you kind of uh, dealt with these challenges as such? I think the key, as I said, my kind of key um, axiom, kind of, you know, um, mantra is that you know they're, 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 you, you build up a you build up a richness of the you know, it's a bit like Clifford Geertz's kind of thick description. It, it, it's that you know the more the more material that we can triangulate and 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 overlay and see the additions and so on, the, the the better able we are to hazard has a kind of a, a guess at the context. Um, but you can't, I mean, a, a, apart from, from myself drawing on the work of other scholars who, who are able to A, access material in language that I can't, uh, or B, um, sort of collaborate sort of verbally in discussion and, and, and educate me and inform me about, about some of it. Uh, it is this sense of giving uh, one of my mentors, Greg Denning, a, a, a well-known ethno-historical um, writer in Australia, put it as giving people in the past their own present. So even, you know, the fellow looking out the window in that photo, I don't know who, who I, I can pro probably have some guess about what role he might have been playing there, but I don't know who he is or what his name was, but, but he will feature in, in my history writing, even as an enigma. Um, so it's about acknowledging, um, yeah, a, 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 acknowledging the way that the record tries to drive local people out by putting them back there um, 
and and there are there are it's about looking for those little moments that that, that do provide sort of sparks where you can hazard a guess at like you know the nasty people putting their hand on Thomas Jones's pen or you know there, there are these sort of gestures or um, you know visual cues uh, that are sometimes half hidden that you can that you can then use to sort of make bigger points um, about sort of relationships um, but you, and you always do it with trepidation because uh, you know I, I'm, I sort of look at myself as a kind of hopefully a kind of humble historian I don't like making big big claims about things because I'm aware of the of, of the dangers but, but you know we have to we have to we have to proffer some um, some critique beyond description so, so I think it's about um, analysing the British text for, 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 for that sort of material. And maybe another example would be, you know, amateur theatre. Now, I gave a bit of a talk about this earlier. A amateur theatre in Shalom, amongst the British elite, he was very popular. Uh, and, and a lot's been written about, you know, the gaiety theatre in Calcutta and the, the sort of the, the repertoire of, um, of of touring companies and so on. Um, now th this isn't about cussy people, but but I've 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 managed to get together some of the, the the scripts of the sort of plays that they were performing, and also reviews of plays that I don't actually have the scripts of that they performed. And by analysing the way they performed the Kasi in those plays, that 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 helps me again to get get a grip on on on, on putting on keeping the Kasi people central to this history. So in eighteen ninety eight, one of the British uh, military background people can't remember his name off the top of my head wrote a play about, it was called The Quake to Arms, and it was a play about Shalom, in, and he used the earthquake as the scene. But one of my dreams is to find the script of this play, but I've got reviews of it. And, and, and in it, you, 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 get the, you get this sort of cast of stereotyped characters, and one of them is a Cassie character, and in the review of the way that the British, and they're all former amateur the theatrical companies, in the way that the, that the reviews note the performance of the, of the Cassie character, who's played by an Englishman, um, you, you learn a huge amount about, um, you know, subjectivity and agency and, you know, by, by what they're not saying as well as by the tone and temper and, and description of what they are saying, um, and and these are the these are the moments that are gold for the for the micro historian. So I'll, you know we can never we can never know. Um, I mean another another example is you know it's trying it's trying to um, trying to ensure that that the casting people are always in the scene. Um, I found a review of the non prem dance. Um, in the 1890s, and it was held in June that year, and it was a description of all the people from Shalom going to Smith and, and the um, the you know, Lady Ward and the British people and the Catholic nuns and the, and and like everyone from Shalom went up the zigzag road to. It's a description of this day. It's an extraordinary description and describes the dance and, and so on. And at the end, it has this beautiful little, um, you know, throwaway almost, uh, talking about how a story about how the chief commissioner went there once, and it, and it, and it rained, and he he got wet, but he fortunately had a, a spare pair of undergarments, and he was taken into a little cubicle side room to change, and. 
all the local women were peering through the curtain, <coughs> looking at him. So it's a little, little joke, but there's, there's, a, there's a story about, um, you know, who's watching who and, and, and again about, um, you know, the, the dynamic that's, that's going on. So that, they're the sort of little things that I try and find too. I mean, A, a tell a good story, but B, I think that helps a reader understand, you know, what's going on. But even though, even though I'll never find what those women thought, I know, I know they were thinking something, and I know that they were, they were, they were putting themselves very much in that scene. Uh, and we can divine a sense of their agency there, even though we don't have written records of that. So it's those types of things. But that's why it takes so long um, to be a, you know, to, to write this sort of ethno-historical, you know, thick, rich description sort of approach because you're looking for those moments that exemplify bigger pictures and you've got to sift through a huge amount of material before you find moments. Thank you for the, for the question. <laughs>